All right, so here's a few cryptography things that are fun. One thing, of course, is an old trick. You should know how to get past Windows passwords. Windows passwords are just ornaments. If you, um, if you don't encrypt the hard drive, then you can just totally get past them. This is an old trick. I did this on Windows 2000 mm -hmm. server. Damn uh, file, rainbow table. No, you don't even need to do any of that. Um, Windows 2000 server, you can do it by reinstalling on top of it, and then you open a command prompt while it's installing. As oh, yeah. That's old, <laughs> and this one here, I use another old trick, which is util man. So if you have a Windows machine that's under your control, like a VMware, then you boot from the install disk. And after you boot it from the install disk, um, which can be a little tricky if your VMware doesn't want to boot from the CD, then you get here and you click repair your computer. And in repair your computer, you can open a command prompt. This is an option. You click troubleshoot and then command prompt. And it gets you to the same place that you did before. Now you have a system command prompt. You can just execute commands. So what you can do is make a copy CMD to utilman.exe. Utilman is the handicapped accessibility you utility that lets you type in the password with some other device, like something you're holding in your mouth or something, and you can press a special key to turn it on. So now you restart the machine and you just press logo U, which launches Utilman, which is supposed to pop up like an on-screen keyboard, but now it just opens a command prompt. So now you have an administrator command prompt and you can now just um, type in and change a password, net user and name password to change passwords. So it's an old trick, you know, but it's, um, anyway, it's a good thing to know. I used to use uh, third party hacking tools to do this. And the easiest thing is just use a Windows install disk these days. It's, it's a basic thing that everybody should know. This is basically a uh, tech support issue. People are always forgetting their password. Somebody get past a password is what you want. And then there's Hashcat. If you do want to crack a hash, Hashcat is the boss tool. And, um, you can run Hashcat on these Debian Linux boxes. Now, as Caitlin pointed out before, if you uh, pay Google or use the right request or something, you can actually get right. graphics cards in Sorry, Google Cloud Machine and make them that. fast. Do you want to know what an example of a request sentence is? Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. But anyway, the, what I'm going to do here is I'm just using the CPU. You can use Hashcat with just the CPU. It's not as fast, but it's fast enough. And it does show you a main point here. If you go to a um, Linux machine, like your Debian machine, you install, at, create a new user, you'll create a Unix password and you can view the hash. They're just in the etch shadow file. And this is what a Linux password hash looks like. You have the name of the user, Jose. Then you have this um, $6, which is a type six password, which is the most secure version. And then you have a salt, which goes from that dollars to the next dollars here. So it's 16 characters or so of salt. That's random characters added to the password. And then, and the password here I used was I think just password. Yeah, P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D. But if two people use the same password in Linux, you do not have the same hash because it adds this random salt before it hashes it. So it adds this junk to password, then it hashes it, with 5,000 rounds of SHA-512, and that's what all the rest of this junk is. That is a very secure password hash. Windows is appalling and pathetic. Windows uses one round of MD4 because they wrote it in 1993, which is so old, MD5 hadn't even been written yet, and they never updated it, even though it is completely breakable. So it's like a million times less secure than a Linux password hash. Anyway, so this is a secure Linux password hash, and so you can now um, you can see how it works with this file called etslogin.def. That tells you how the hash is calculated. And here it tells you it's a SHA-512 and it's using 5,000 rounds. I the like it because I like Hashcap because it can use the GPU as well. It's what? You yeah. can use the GPU as well. Oh, oh, absolutely. That's much better if you have a GPU. Anyway, so now you can just put that thing in a file and you have to delete some of the extra junk from it. So you have just the password hashes and not the names or the um, other numbers at the end. And then you can just install Hashcat. Um, you can download a word list of 128,000 words, and then you can just use it to crack the hash. So this dash dash force 
is what forces Hashcat to run on a machine that just has a CPU, and it is so non-optimized for this, it doesn't even have the open CL library that it should have, which is what these default Google Cloud machines are like. Now, you can get more powerful Google Cloud machines, but I wanted to write this project so we can just use a default one uh, to see how it works. So this will, the main thing to know is you have to format the hash file correctly, and um, you have to know what your, um, what type of hash it is. And Linux type six hashes are M1800, and you can run the uh, tool and look at the help page to get a list of them. There's many hash types supported. So anyway, this will now start hashing, and like Nmap, it'll just sit there, and you can press enter to see how far it's gone. So when I pressed enter here, it was at 16%. And even on a single core, not much memory, no GPU machine, like it doesn't take long to go through 100,000 passwords. I think it took uh, four minutes or something to find the password if it's in that list. And so um, then you can get a list of passwords from my server and crack them. There's four of them here. And uh, you can crack them in various ways. And then there's some windows. Here's some windows hashes to crack. And so you get to try them. And the main thing you'll notice is that you can do a lot of Windows machine passwords a lot faster. You can even multiply the size of the list by 100 by putting two digits at the end of all the passwords. And you'll still be able to crack with Hashcat. And so then I should talk about blockchains. Blockchains have gone down a little bit, but they're still coming. And I was real happy to see I managed to get Hyperledger working again. So, uh-oh, looks like this one is not loading. How rude. Um, I'll have to fix that link. Uh, 141 project H530. How rude. Well, I'll bring that one up later, but we'll go on to Hyperledger. Hyperledger is the IBM blockchain. This is what people are really going to use. Um, and here's, uh, they've been working on this for years. They're not kidding. They have a whole suite of blockchain products. So everyone's going to start using these. And the one I stuck here was Iroha, which is just the simplest one to get started with. A blockchain is just a database, but it's a database where everybody has write permission. Everybody can add data to the blockchain, but nobody can ever delete or remove data from a blockchain. So it's good for something like a financial ledger or a event log where you have some record. And the thing is nobody should be able to change what the record is. So if you want to keep a legal record of something, um, anyway, so um, I see a question about Android there, but I don't really understand it. Um, in Android Metasploit, I get the APK and I can't download it because of Google Play. Yeah, I don't understand that. Um, you, if you're in a foreign country that blocks Google like China, then you're pretty much hosed. Um, anyway, uh, I'm not sure. You might try contacting Caitlin, put it in the public chat and she might know the answer. But anyway, so this one here, you install Docker, and then you start a PostgreSQL container in one Docker image. So now this machine is listing on this port 5432. That's the database. And then you create a block store, which is a Docker data storage volume. Get a configuration file, and then you start an Iroha container. So you're running two containers. Containers are like virtual machines, but they're much smaller and much faster. So you can run a lot of containers, and this is all running on just a default Debian machine without any extra hard drive space or CPU or anything. And so you will now have a blockchain you can control. And you'll see a command line here, which, by the way, looks an awful lot like a mainframe command line in Python, in COBOL. So you can make a transaction, a query, or a status request. And this is what you do. You can create an asset, create something called CoolCoin. You can issue them. You can send them from one account to another, and you can watch the status of these transactions. It's a financial ledger, and you can practice using blockchains here. So this lets you set up a real commercial blockchain of the kind that people are really going to use at companies. And um, the one I really wanted to show you was POWH coin. This is awesome. This is Ethereum. Ethereum is the blockchain system intended to run code. So it's not like Bitcoin, which is just money. Ethereum is code. You make an, a virtual machine that runs on the blockchain and everybody can join it. And what these guys did, some people on 4chan made a Ponzi coin, which was supposed to be a joke. And people put in almost a million dollars of real money 
and it all got stolen because of a bug in the code. And you can totally reproduce that exploit because Ethereum, back about two years ago when blockchains were really, cryptocurrencies were really hot, there was a lot of money. And so they made all these training tools to teach you blockchains. And they made this thing called Remix, which is fantastic. You can run a whole Ethereum blockchain in your browser without installing anything. It's simulated, but it's good enough to totally practice using blockchains. You don't have to install anything. So it comes with some contracts. This is Solidity. Solidity is the language you write Ethereum contracts in, and it looks just like JavaScript. It's a really simple language. And Solidity contracts are what makes blockchains. And so there's one here called POWH coin. This is the entire cryptocurrency Ponzi coin scheme. It's only 306 lines of code. This is an entire smart contract. It's an investment scheme where people can invest money and um, exchange money from people and stuff like that. It's a, a whole investment scheme. It only takes about 300 lines of code and it has a fatal security flaw, which was used to steal almost a million bucks. So you put it in that thing, you get the source code off GitHub and just paste it in. It's open source. And then you can compile the contract so I go here to compile it. And I compile the code. And now down here is the status. And it tells me a bunch of warnings, but no errors. So the code will run. OK, now that I compiled it, I can deploy the code. This is where you put it on the blockchain, and people can join the system. So I deploy it, and I can choose which kind of blockchain to use. There are different ones, but I'm going to use the JavaScript VM, which is a simulated blockchain right in the browser, which is awesome. And so I'm going to deploy it into that blockchain. And here's the status going by. And it shows creating Ponzi coin token, and it's working. And down here, it's created a thing called Ponzi token. And if I expand it, it's now got a bunch of buttons here. So it's even got a GUI of sorts. Here's what you can do. You can put funds in the blockchain. You can approve a transaction. You can sell tokens, transfer, withdraw, and so on. You can just do it by putting addresses in here. So I'm going to make this nice and big for the video and stuff. So now I'm going to try and do this. And if I foul up, which I often do, we may have to, um, I may have to just tell you about it. But this is fun if I can make it work. You just have to be very careful. So uh, let me shrink these instructions a little. And OK. So the first thing is, let me shove this to the side. All right. And then pull the remix out and put it over here. OK. So the first thing is to understand the blockchain. The simulated blockchain is here. It gives me 15 accounts with these long random numbers, and they each have 100 ETH. Now, every time you do anything on the blockchain, you have to pay a transaction fee, which is a tiny amount of money. And this one was used to deploy the contract. So that's why it's lost a little bit of Ether. So it's slightly less than 100 Ether. But that's what you do. They all have 100 Ethers to play with. OK, so now I'm going to fund the contract. I'm going to take the first account, this one here with 99.99. I'm going to put 50 Ether into the um, Ponzi scheme. So I'm going to fit now ways are these tiny things. Ether is the largest thing of which you have 100. That's the largest increment of money. And it's worth like 100 to 200 bucks last time I checked. So 50 Ether, of course, these are fake Ether. These aren't worth any real money, but it's the same technology. So now I'm going to go down and um, hit fund. And that should do it. So right now I have almost 100 Ether in my account. But I'm going to go down here and fund the contract with that Ether. And if I look down here, you see it's executing. Here's the status. So it's doing things. And it gave me a green check mark. It successfully executed that command. So since it did, now I only have 50 Ether left in that account. It went into the Ponzi token investment scheme. Now I can view my balance. We saw that 50 Ether. Now I'm going to add another investor. So I'm going to cut the second account and put in one Ether. So here's the second account with 100 Ethers. And I'm going to take one Ether. And I'm going to put that in the contract two. So now I'm going to have two investors. One guy invested 50 
coins and the other guy invested one coin, so he's down to 99. All right, now I'm gonna transfer funds. So I'm gonna, you do it in two steps, your approval withdrawal and then your performer withdrawal. So um, to approve a withdrawal, I have to select the third account up here, okay, and copy the account number into the clipboard, which is here. Now select account number two, okay, and this means that the approved action will be funded by paying the transaction fee out of account number two. Now I got to go down to the orange approve button and um, right, expand this and I have spender and value. Now the spender is going to be the address in my clipboard. Okay, and the value is going to be one. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to move account one ether from one account to another. Now, I hit the transact. I've now approved withdrawing one from account number three, and I paid for the gas from account number two, and that transaction succeeded. Now, um, I'm going to check the balance of old for account number three. So let me go up here and get account number three, which is this one that contains 100 ether and put it in the clipboard. And now I want to see how much money is in that account. So I go here and put in that account number. And it's zero. That account has not invested anything into the Ponzi coin. So it has a balance of zero. But what I'm going to do, this is the hack. Normally you'd contact, you transfer from account two into account three, but what I'm gonna do is go from account two to the contract address, but I'm gonna execute it with my identity being account number three. And this is because there's a confusion in the uh, account numbers in the code. So what we do is I go, show up to the accounts box and I get a copy of account number two here which is this one, okay. And now I go down to transfer from. Okay, and in the from address, I put that account number. Now in the to address, I'm gonna put the funds account number. So I'm not sending it into account number three, I'm sending it into the Ponzi token fund itself. This is what the fund button did. And the root of the flaw here is the programmers did not force you to use the fund button. They allowed the transfer from method to perform a fund action, but it doesn't keep track of the account numbers correctly. Okay, and now um, I put that in third account. Now I go up here and I make the source of everything the third account. And so this should be I guess these numbers are different every time. That's rude. Anyway, that's the third account that contains 100 ether. Okay. And this one here goes into the account. Okay. And I wanted the value to be one here. Okay. So I've either succeeded or I haven't, but if I succeeded, we just stole all the money. So I do the transaction, it finishes, and what happened is it subtracted one from an empty account. And that causes an underflow and it moves, rolls around to a huge number. So what I wanna do is check the balance of account number three. So I go up here and get account number three and put it in the clipboard. And then I use balance of old, which is here. And you see now I have this unthinkably huge number. Because I was able to subtract one ether from an empty account, it rolled over. So I have 115 times 10 to the 50 or 10 to the 80 coins. I have an infinite number of coins and people stole all the money this way. It's bloody awesome. Anyway, so this shows a lot of things. It shows how simple it is to make these errors. The specific errors are shown down here. You can look at the code and see why. 
it gets confused about which account to draw the money from and they the routine that is supposed to check that you have the money uses the wrong address and it checks account number two and says the money is in there, but then it actually draws the money out of account number three instead. So it draws from an empty account. And like I mentioned before, if this thing was written in Rust, this would never happen. I was talking about that earlier today. Rust doesn't let underflows happen or memory corruption happen, but this solidity language totally does. Anyway, so I thought that was fun, a real hack in blockchains. And I think I'm going to stop this one and post the recording and then check for questions to answer. I see 